uh, Aira. Oops. Okay. Um, these first two lectures are going to be on materialism and computation in particular. And these, this, this first two, um, I'm looking at information, entropy, and capitalist mass production, and what the intellectual and historical connections between them are. So I'm going to start off by talking about what work is. Um, what is labor? What is work? And what is information? How does information relate to wealth and to work? And how does understanding what information is help us understand the economy? And I'll be referencing people like Adam Smith, uh, James Watt, the engineer, Charles Babbage, the mathematician, Karl Marx and James Clark Maxwell, the physicist. Starting out with labor and what three classical political economists said about it. Um, Adam Smith starts off the um, wealth of nations saying that labor was the first price, the original purchase money that was paid for all things. And the same theme continues in the political economy of Charles Babbage, where he says, the cost of any article may be reduced in its ultimate analysis to the quantity of labor by which it is produced. And the same theme occurs in Marx, economy of time. To this, all economy ultimately reduces itself. Economy of time, along with the planned distribution of labor time among the various branches of production, remains the first economic law on the basis of communal production. Now, it's not surprising that Marx is saying similar things because he closely studied Smith and he closely studied Babbage. And the basic formula that comes from these thinkers is that the cost of things or the value of things comes down to work time. At the same time that Adam Smith was professor of moral philosophy here in Glasgow, um, in the department of what was then called natural philosophy, uh, Professor Black who was a professor of natural philosophy, was working along with his te technician, what you might now say a research assistant, called James Watt, and they were laying the foundations for the theory of heat and temperature. Now, you might think that what Smith was doing, what Black are doing, were disconnected. Um, but that isn't actually the case. They weren't just developing these ideas in the same time and place. The, it turns out that concepts from engineering science, from the practice of material production, which were stimulated by Black and Watt, paralleled and later became the foundation for classical economic thought. Now, these are early steam engines. Black was working on heat and he came up with the idea of a latent heat, both spe specific heat, the amount of heat required to raise, a, uh, say, a pound of a material by one degree Fahrenheit, if he was using uh, British units, or in modern terms, a kilo of material by one degree centigrade. The he was interested in that, but he was also interested in latent heat. Why did it suddenly require more heat to boil water than to raise it to a, than it took to raise it up to a hundred degrees? 
why did you require 200 times as much heat to raise it to 101 degrees centigrade as you required to raise it to 100 degrees centigrade? So this is an observation he'd made. He'd made the observation that heat was measurable and quantifiable and that a huge amount of heat went into boiling things. This was a new scientific discovery at that point. Now, what was given a steam engine to repair? They've still got the model steam engine in the museum at Glasgow. And it was basically a Newcomen engine of the type shown on the left here. The way those worked, these were already in widespread use pumping water from mines in Britain. The main use of power at that stage was to raise water from considerable depth. The way they worked, you had a boiler here, which was basically just a modified form of the types of boilers that distillery were used for distilling. Copper boilers, which generated steam, but they were not under any significant pressure. Um, steam was admitted into the cylinder and allowed it to rise under the weight of a beam here, which drew the opposite end down. As the beam went down, it displaced some water at the bottom of the mine shaft. You then shut off the valve from the steam here and open another valve, which sprays water into it. And you spray water into it, the steam condenses and creates a vacuum and the air pressure then pushed the piston down. So these were what's ter what were termed atmospheric engines. They weren't termed steam engines, they're atmospheric engines because the air pressure pushed the thing down. What Watt realized, which no one without his scientific training would have been able to realize, that a great deal of heat was being wasted in this condensation process. Firstly, he knew about the specific heat of, of the latent heat of vaporization. And he also knew that when you spray water into that, you'll cool the whole cylinder down. So next time you open the, the valve to put steam in, a significant part of that will condense and that's wasted heat. So he modified the design so that you have a separate condenser here. Basically, it's shown as a, a U-shaped pipe that is sunk into a tank of water with this mechanism here is a pump which pumps water out of the condenser. The same basic principle operated as before. Steam was allowed into the, into the cylinder when it reached the top, the cylinder was connected to the condenser, a vacuum was created and atmospheric pressure drove the, the beam down. Why was this a, a big improvement? It's because it wasn't wasting heat. And what was able to sell these to mine owners on the basis that this machine will do, use far less coal than the old ones and the entire purpose of your mine is to produce coal if we can save you coal that's going to be worth your while and he rented them out on the basis of the getting a share of the coal saved but to do that he had to be able to quantify work how much work was being done well at the time he was selling these, there were two mechanisms of getting water out of a mine. One would be to use a Newcomen engine. The other would be to use a horse turning a, um, a windlass and get the turning of the windlass to operate the pump. So he took the horse as the standardized unit of work. And he then measured the power of his steam engine in terms of the horsepower standardize the horsepower in terms of raising a given weight per hour 
actually measured what a horse could do, how much weight could it raise per hour, why did he talk about it in terms of raising weight per hour? Because that's what they were doing. They were raising water from the bottom of a mine. So he quantified, he, he not only invents the steam engine, but he invents the quantification of work. He invents the concept of power as something measurable in terms of a standardized unit, the horsepower. Now, this is cutting edge engineering at the time he's doing it, the late 1700s. By the 19th century, these ideas have percolated into Victorian society. It's a steampunk society and the ideas of steam technology and how steam technology worked were quite generalized. Everyone knew about them. So ideas from what can enter into political economy as part of the background information that everyone has. So let, let's take a table here of the ideas that were being developed at the same time in what was then moral philosophy and was then natural philosophy. Nowadays, you'd call it economics and physics. But the, these were both treated as branches of philosophy in, in the 1700s. So since they're in Scotland, we'll assume that we're talking about making whiskey. So we'll take, if you're taking Adam Smith's measure, he would be saying, OK, you're going to value whiskey in terms of gold and how many gold sovereigns will a barrel of whiskey sell for? What determines the number of um, gold sovereigns that a barrel sells for is determined by two things. The specific labor content of gold. How many hours gold mining labor is there to produce the amount of gold in one sovereign coin? The value of whiskey is then determined by the labor required to make the whiskey in terms of hours. And the price is then determined by the ratio between these two quantities. And the third thing that is relevant is the ability to work or the laboring power of the distillery workers, because that's what, according to Adam Smith drives the whole process. Now, if you go over to the black side, the um, natural philosophy side, the equivalent to price was the temperature, say measured on a mercury thermometer of a quantity of whiskey. The equivalent to the specific labor content of gold would be the specific heat of mercury. And the value of the the equivalent to the value of the whiskey is the heat content of the whiskey. You can then measure that in terms of thermal energy it, and thermal energy in principle, you can treat as as in terms of foot pounds or horsepower seconds. And at the bottom of it is the ability to work power the, measured in horsepower, say of uh, a steam engine that the distillery has for raising barrels. So the same set of concepts are present. They're present in political economy and they're present in natural philosophy. The heat is equivalent to work there and work is equivalent to value. But we know that animals can work too. What takes a horse as his standard of work? Why does the labor of a horse not create value? Why is it only human work that counts as creating value? How does human and animal labor differ? Why does the labor theory of value not say all labor creates value? In fact, when you read Adam Smith, he talks about a farmer having laboring cattle and laboring servants. So at some stages in Adam Smith's account, the cattle and the servants are both sources of labor. But that's before what? Because what hadn't 
commercialised his technology at the time Smith was writing. Smith knew what, and they used to talk together, but it hadn't been commercialised. And if you read the um, Adam Smith Wealth of Nations, there is no discussion of steam power in it at all. But we know that the effect of the introduction of steam engines was to displace horses. Horses ceased to be used as a source of energy. They hung on for short distance urban transport. Long distance transport shifted to the steam engine. And once the internal combustion engine was developed, they lost their role there. Uh, the horses went to the knacker's yard. But human workers survive. Why has human labor survived, whereas capitalism has displaced, with ho displaced horses? Could it not get rid of humans as well? Could, would that not be more profitable? Now, Marx gives an argument for that, this, um, where he says, a spider constructs operations that resemble those of a weaver. And a bee puts to shame many an architect in the construction of her cells. But what distinguishes the worst of architects from the best of bees is this. The architect raises his structure in the imagination before he builds it in reality. At the end of lab every labor process, we get a result that already existed in the imagination of the laborer at its commencement. He not only affects a change of form in the material on which he works, but he also realizes a purpose of his own that gives the law to his modus operandi and which he must support and to which he must subordinate his will. Now, this passage indicates that Marx himself was worried about this. Why is it human labor? Why are horses not a source of value? And he puts forward a hypothesis here for why it is. Now, I'm going to be critical of that hypothesis. Firstly, are animals really lacking in purpose? Is this not a, an anthropocentric assumption? A spider may be so small and her brain so tiny that it's plausible that just blind instinct run the conscious prospect of spy of flies drives her to spin. But it's doubtful that you can apply the same to mammals and indeed recent research on spiders indicates that they're able to form plans. They're able to form plans as the, to, the best way to get from one place to another and they're able to form plans as to the best way to construct their web, given the twigs and leaves around them that are available to them. Now, let's look at mammals. If a horse is at the plough, we don't think that the horse envisages in, in advance the corn that he's helping to produce. But the horse is just a slave He's bent to the purpose of the plowman. He's been reduced to a source of mechanical power, just overcoming the dumb resistance of the soil. And as such, he's readily replaced by a John Deere. But take a carnivore. Does a wolf stalking its prey not intend to eat it? Does a fox sneaking up on something and planning its approach not show purpose? Clearly they do. So purpose is not something specific to us. And then we look at the architect himself. Take the example of the architect. And this, when you do that, the argument looks even shaped here. Because do architects actually build things? Marx says the architect builds it in his imagination before he actually builds it. Well, occasionally, Architects, some architects, a minority of architects actually build their own homes with their own hands. But in general, what gives someone the status of an architect as opposed to a building laborer 
is that they don't get their hands dirty with anything other than ink. It's their position in the social division of labor that makes them architects. And the key to our ability as a society to build complicated structures is the fact that we can store the information required to build them in an external paper and ink plan, which one person performs. This is handed over to other people who then follow the plan. And it is this stored information that distinguishes our work from animals. That's why our buildings can be complex. Because coordinated division of labor based on the separation of mental from manual labor allows that to take place. So let's look at some of the links I've been talking about now. I said what was developing the steam engine in the 1770s. Smith was discovering or studying the division of labor. The French Revolution takes place. One of the tasks given by the revolutionary government is setting up accurate systems of scientific tables, tables of logarithms, tables of sines and cosines to be used in scientific calculation. The mathematician De Prony recounts that he came across a copy of Smith's Wealth of Nations in, a, in, a, in translation in France, read it, understood the principle of division of labor, and thought, OK, I can apply the division of labor to mental labor. And I will draw up these tables, not by doing it myself, but by hiring a large number of people most of whom know nothing more than the skills of adding people who could do bookkeeping if i can get enough big clerks who can add numbers i can set a small number of mathematicians to give them formulae which reduce everything just to addition so he applies the division of labor to mental labor so that you get an army of clerks doing addition and a small number of mathematicians directing them. And from this, we can produce the tables. Now, go forward 15 years to 1810 and Babbage is checking some of these tables with the astronomer Herschel. And he's horrified by the number of mistakes. Even though the division of labor had enabled the tables to be produced, it didn't account for the fact that the clerks made mistakes in addition. Every now and then a clerk would get a digit wrong. And this would then propagate into subsequent rows of the table. And you had to no knock off whole, whole sections of it. But 1810, steam technology and steam powered machinery was known about. And Babbage exclaims to Herschel, I wish to God these calculations had been executed by steam, not by human labor. And from this desire to remove the errors of human labor, he came up with the difference engine. And what it did is it mechanized De Prony's division of mental and manual labor, which had allowed the production of these mathematical tables in the first place. Now, what Babbage says about the division of labor, the division of labor suggests the contrivance of tools and machinery to execute its process. When each process by which any article is produced is a sole occupation of one individual, his whole attention being devoted to a very limited and simple operation. Improvements in the form of his tools or in the mode of using them are much more likely to occur than if the mind were distracted by a greater variety of circumstances. 
Such an improvement in the tool is generally the first step towards a machine. So in Babbage, there is the idea that machines are generalizations of tools. They're generalizations of tools in which the sequencing of actions is taken out of the control of a human operative and handed over to the machine. And what he wanted to do was apply this to the production of the mathematical tables. So I'm going to look at Babbage's difference engine. Until the 1960s, most day-to-day -day calculations, including navigational calculations, were done using books of lookup tables. These would be tables of sines, cosines, um, logarithms, and in the case of navigation, ephemerides telling you the expected position of stars in the sky at given times of day. And these tables um, were prepared mathematically using Taylor and Maclaurin series. So we can have sine x is equal to x minus x to the third over three factorial plus x to the fifth over five fact fa factorial minus x to the seventh over seven factorial plus x to the nine over nine factorial, etc. But you can get a reasonable approximation by taking the first few terms. Um, and the factorials you can expand out into constants. And therefore, the only things you have to work out are raising these numbers to a large power. And this is where, if you didn't use de Prony's method, you are likely to get errors, or at least you required a skilled mathematician to raise a number to the seventh power. Point is that these are all polynomials. And what Babbage proposed to do was apply machinery to the computing of polynomials. Now, rather than taking signs, I'm going to take a simpler example, which is the example Babbage uses in his own literature to explain how it works. That of calculating how many cannonballs there are in a pile. If you go round old castles in Britain, you can still see many of the castles have rows of cannons lined up on the battlements. And next to the cannons, there are piles of cannonballs. The cannonballs are held in triangular brass plates at the bottom called brass monkeys. And the balls are piled up on top of them. And this was something everyone would have seen in the 19th century. Everyone was familiar with these. You can still see them. Babbage gives illustrations, okay? Suppose I have a ball, one cannonball, it forms an edge of length one on the, the side. The next size of pile I could get has four balls in it. It's got the one ball on the top and it's got a triangle of three balls underneath that. The next size turns out to have 10, the next size to have 20. This is just a practical knowledge people had of piling up cannonballs. So, he makes a table of the length of the pile edge against the number of cannonballs. Okay, that's just observation, practical skill. He then expresses it as a polynomial, that the number of balls you'll get in a pile of length x is x over 3 plus x squared over 2 plus x to the power 3 over 6. And this then predicts the numbers he's got. And that's a polynomial and is similar in principle to the kinds of polynomials that are used to compute sines and cosines. So look at this. Those are the numbers, the se sequential numbers you obtain. He says, take the difference between these numbers. So he has the first order difference. So in going from 1 to 4, the difference is 3. In going from 4 to 10, the difference is 6. From 10 to 20, the difference is 10. Then take what he calls a second order difference. Take 3 from 6 and you get 3. 
Take six from 10 and you get four. Notice these, these are just going up. They're counting. Take the third order difference, it's one in all cases. So this is his illustration. He says, okay, I can build a machine that'll do this because the last term is constant. And he says, it'll, it'll turn out to be the case for any polynomial, we have n differences for a polynomial of order x to the n. And this is the machine he built. Built this in the 1820s. Um, it can handle third order pol polynomials. And basically, it's a set of linked adding machines. You set it to some initial values. You set the third order polynomial to whatever you want. It would be one in the case of the cannonballs. You turn the handle and it gives you the successive answers. The one he designed and got a huge government grant, which in modern terms would many, be many, many millions of pounds to build. Um, was capable of doing seventh order polynomials. But it turned out to be too hard, given the engineering technology of the 1820s, to mass produce the cogwheels, the hundreds and hundreds of identical cogwheels that were going to be needed to give the answer accurately. So, it was only partly completed in his lifetime. The, the Science Museum in London, which had all his plans, completed the machine in 2002 to demonstrate how it worked. And it works perfectly. It does what it was intended to do. Now that we have precision engineering to cut the cogwheels, we can build them. Now, if we talk, go to Marx now, you can see that Babbage's ideas influenced him. He says, a machine proper is therefore a mechanism which, after being set in motion, performs with its tools the same operations that were formerly done by the workmen with similar tools. In the first place, in the form of machinery, the implements of labour become automatic things moving independently of the workman. They are henceforth an industrial perpetuum mobile that could go on producing forever. So the workman is removed and the sequencing is provided mechanically. Now, if we go back to the illustrations, this green area here in my illustration is the sequencing mechanism of the difference engine. The type of sequencing that Marx uh, for the labor, sorry, the type of sequencing required for the automation that Marx described and have an infinite repetition of basic actions could be done by this kind of clockwork device. Basically, it operates in a cycle as you turn the handle one complete turn of the handle produces a cycle and a series of cams control the sequencing of the, the whole machine. In this case, the operations that the machine is doing is our addition and it's doing them reliably because it's mechanical. In the case of a spinning mule in the factory zone by Engels, the operations are firstly, what does a spinner do? Have you watched anyone with a spinning wheel? Has anyone, have anyone watched a spinning wheel in use? The first thing you do is you draw the wool or the cotton out, stretch it. You then allow the, the rotating spinning wheel to twist it. Then at the, the, on the pin of the, the spinning wheel. You allow the twisting from that. And then you draw it down onto the bobbin and allow it to be wound in. So there's three basic sequences. Drawing out, twisting, winding in. If you look at a 
mule in a spinning factory of the type that operated in the 19th century. Exactly the same sequences are performed, except they're performed on a hundred spindles at once. And they're performed over a much greater distance. The drawing out of a spinster could only be as far as her arms were. On the mule, the drawing out is 20 feet or more because they have a moving carriage which draws all the, the yarn out at once, allows it to be twisted and then wound onto the bobbins. So this is what Marx means. The sequence of operations that were formerly done by hand are taken over and done by a machine in a perpetual unending sequence driven by steam power. Now let's look at some other links. In order to build his machine, Babbage was going to need precision engineering. And in his economy and machinery and manufactures, a large part of the book is basically a summary of the most advanced technical arts that were known at the time. He traveled the continent studying under artisans the best technical arts that they had. Something very rare for a modern economist. Modern economists don't go and learn from artisans how they make things. Um, and he studied existing technologies and decided he needed precision die casting. And he hired a, a, a technician a guy called Clement, who worked for him in developing this precision die casting and later left him over disputes over pay and played a key role in establishing the precision engineering industry in Britain and from then the precision machine tool industry in the world. Ten years late after starting he writes his book Economy of Machinery and Manufactures and 30 years later Marx studying political economy in the British Museum Library comes across Babbage's work and uses it as the basis for his understanding of the automated or self-acting factory. Now, people tend to think that automation is something new, that it is a late 20th, 21st century development. Part of that is just a change in language. In the 19th century, these were described as self-acting machines. Now you'd call them automatic, but self-acting and automatic just involve shifting from Germanic to Greek uh, terminology in English. Babbage's idea was that the key to automation is the development of automatic sequential control mechanisms taking the control from the worker. And this gives Marx the key to the alienated labor in the automatic factory. Uh, if you haven't read it already, I can recommend you read the novel Player Piano by Kurt Vonnegut. It was written in the 1940s and it's a 1940s image of American capitalism as the worker is replaced by automation. And it's a very 1940s idea of how automation will work because his, his archetype is the player piano, the piano that plays music independently of the pianist. And that itself, the player piano, was derived from Jacquard's automated weaving machine which used rolls of punched paper to automate the weaving of patterns. So it's an early 19th century steampunk technology but Vonnegut gives a, a dramatic sort of account of the impact this has on, on American industrial workers of the 1940s and he gives the example of 
in he meets in a bar the hero meets in a bar an old workman who tells him he used to be a skilled um fitter in uh an engineering works but they attached to his lathe a measuring device recording the movements on a magnetic wire tape recorder sorry a magnetic wire recorder which was the what preceded tape recorders and after they'd recorded his movements they never needed him anymore the machine just played the same movements forever afterwards so the this is the 1940s worry about technology it's the same worry about technology that was being expressed 40 50 years later and it is the same worry about the machine taking control that comes from the inventions of Babbage and Jacquard in the um, 1820s or slightly earlier for Jacquard so the sequence here is Smith and Watt to give to Babbage Babbage applies it critically to develop the communist doctrine okay now let's look at the issue of making choices where does choice come into labor the sequencers used in the difference engine or if you look at a, a mule the sequencer used in a mule allows a fixed sequence of steps to be performed same sequence of steps again and again and again and these were steps that previous in some cases let's take the uh, Babbage's difference engine these were steps that required mental labor the addition of of 20 digit numbers that's not easy that's a considerable skill adding 20 digit numbers and he was able to treat these as a basic atomic operations adding 20 digit numbers sequencing these so these were things that previously required mental labor and they did it following the method of division of labor that de Prony had taken from Smith. Smith's teaching on the division of labor taken over by de Prony applied to mental labor and then Babbage says we can automate the mental labor as well but it only allowed fixed operations there's no element of judgment or decision making other than when to carry that is the only element of judgment that the clerks had to carry out in de Prony's work clark had to know when to carry one onto the next digit when adding up long sequences of digits and that was the only element of judgment in the different century and in fact it's a quite beautiful and very elegant mechanical device he develops for this uh, what in later terms would be called a carry look ahead ad adder but by the 1830s Bambage is more ambitious he wants a general replacement of mental labor, including judgments. And for this, he comes up with the analytical engine. And that's the main reason, apart from the precision engineering, why he wasted the large government grant on the difference engine, because he thought of something even better and started building that before he'd finished the first one. Now, there are four basic arithmetic operations plus minus multiply and divide Babbage having seen that he could mechanize repeated additions and subtractions wanted a machine that could do all of these and this led him to his analytical engine and this prefigured the modern computer arguably if it had been built it would have been the first computer and what did it have Firstly, it had, it had a large number of registers to store decimals, decimal numbers. These are similar to the difference engine in that they were done with cogwheels and the information was stored by the, position, the rotational position on the cogwheels. 
and Babbage referred to these registers V1, V2, etc. Why did he use V to indicate that they were going to, use, to hold variables? In, in addition, he said, I'm going to have an, an, a unit which he called a mill, which was just the copying the industrial terminology of the day where a factory was called a mill. I'm going to have a mill which was capable of performing the four basic operations of arithmetic on two numbers. So the mill could do addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. When I first was working in the computer hardware department of International Computers Limited in, in the design of computers in the 1970s, the influence of Babbage remained sufficiently strong that the component of the mainframe computer that did these operations was still called the mill in, in, uh, in the factory that I worked on. His instructions were on punch cards, which he derived from Jacquard. Jacquard in, had invented the punch card for patterned weaving. And each card specified three variable registers and an arithmetic operation. So it might say variable four equals variable one plus variable three. Now, I don't know if anyone here follows um, current chip technology, but if you look at a ARM processor, the basic instructions of an ARM processor are laid out like that. And the ARM processor is what's used in most mobile phones. So that, that basic design of how the instructions work carries over right down to the present day. And he had a set of data cards which held numbers which could be loaded into registers. So that's what the machine is. But to do any complicated algorithm, any complicated algorithm requires judgment. It requires you to make decisions at a given point. Uh, usually decisions on the basis of whether one number is greater or less than another. And attached to it, he had a printer for the results. In fact, the idea of having a printer was something he'd incorporate into the difference engine because he realized that a source of human error was copying data answers down for the printer to set as type. So the difference engine was designed to produce plate, metal plates for printing. Now Babbage never built his difference engine, but a German engineer called Schultz did build one a few years later, basing, basing it on Babbage's basic design. And it was used for the 1851 census in Britain. And the census data tables, what were called the life tables, the life expectancy tables, were calculated on this difference engine, which produced cast metal plates with the numbers. So the whole process was already automated by the 1850s. What he realized was that if he could build such a machine as this, it would be capable of mechanizing any calculation that a human mathematician might attempt. Now, technical and financial difficulties meant he, you couldn't do it in the 1830s or 40s. But already the essential principles of the modern computer had been laid down and it, implementation waited until the 1940s. My own grandfather worked on a machine to automate the accounts for French railways. And it was designed to do this kinds of mathematical operation. He worked with a Spanish inventor to do it. But again, it was mechanical. It worked with rods. And I remember before he died, my grandfather said that 
he put the production of the parts out to a French engineering company whose um, accuracy of tolerances was not good enough. He should have sent it to a British or German engineering company to make. And when they demonstrated it to the French railways in 1930 something, uh, the machine had so much friction it caught fire and they lost the contract. But doing these kinds of things with mechanical means was not viable. It wasn't until electronics became available that you could reliably do it. But let's have a look at how, how the basic element of judgment was going to be performed by Babbage. This is the mechanism he had. And it shows how he thought through mechanizing judgment. Consider this rotary drum B. The rotary drum could have blocks screwed into it. And it would rotate a certain distance and then move left to right. You can see the arrows of the motion of this drum, the direction it moved. Each time it moved, a set of these blocks would come into contact with a set of feelers, which would read off what was on the blocks. Now, some of these blocks went off to control the multiply, add, etc. units. Some of the rods were doing that, as they would have done in his previous analytical engine. But some of the rods go back and feed back to a set of what are called jump cogs. And these are cog wheels with variable numbers of th uh, threads on them. Four threads on this, sorry, no, cogs. Four cogs, two cogs, one cog. According to which of the rods were in contact, the machine could be moved forward, this main drum could be moved forward either one, two, or four, or any sum of those numbers, positions. So it could jump to any position that could be formed as a sum of one, two, and four. And that would select the next operation to be performed. And whether it did that, would depend on sensing something in the rest of the machine. See this arrow saying running up? That would detect something going on in the rest of the machine. And if that is pushed upwards, then the cogwheel is, this cogwheel is moved up and moves the drum by a certain position. So he can sense what's in somewhere else in the machine and jump by a certain amount. This is all mechanical, but if you've ever worked with the microcode of a modern machine, this is actually microcode. Inside a modern computer, you have a microcode in binary, which can do short jumps, and it can do a conditional jump of one bit to two different positions, according to something it's sensing. So, and this was connected to a link in, to the arithmetic carry of whether you it had a carry from an arithmetic operation. This is basically how a modern computer works too, except you can't look at the cogwheels and see how it's happening. And it, it's quite extraordinary to me to see that the same basic principles were invented by Babbage in the 1830s and then reinvented by Morris Wilkes, the inventor of the EDSAC computer in the 1950, early 1950s. So th this is running up button does the, the, the judgment. So, Already in 1837, we have the basic layers needed for a, a general 
purpose algorithmic system. What are the modern terms you have? You have a clock in a modern computer. In Babbage's term, that's a rotation of the driving wheel. In the photo I had, the museum technician is turning a huge wheel. Babbage intended it to be driven by a steam engine. The, on top of that, you, you have finite state machines. If you get um, A. Ho Hopcroft Norman's book on automata theory, the next stage up is a finite state machine. And that's his sequencer drum. The next stage up in generalization is what's called a register machine. And that is his mill plus store. And then on top of that, nowadays we have software. And in his case, it was instruction and data cards. This general purpose architecture was reinvented in 1945 to 51, when Wilkes in, reinvented conditional execution of microcode using electronic means. And it has been the standard way you build a processor or a microprocessor right down to the, the present day. If you, you're watching this on an Intel or AMD processor that is executing microcode in order to see the pictures you're seeing at the moment. It's executing judgment at this very basic level. Okay, next lecture, I'm gonna talk about entropy. I've been talking about information and choices and labor so far. I'll stop now for questions. Uh, let's stop sharing screen. If anyone wants to ask a question, just unmute yourself and ask the question. Uh -oh. Thank you for the, the talk. Uh, I, I highlighted uh, something you said early on in the beginning, like why has human labor survived? And that's the question that I'm constantly thinking about with like, uh, food delivery and like delivery workers, like why do they exist before, like they're the last agent of human labor before drones, uh, sort of. And I guess my my question is like this power agency, like uh, you were saying like the horse and the plowman and like, uh, I just keep thinking of like, you know, the delivery worker on the bicycles uh, are only mechanical power, even though they're delivering food that is the energy that becomes their own. It's not their food, it's someone else's food. Yeah. And and those are some questions, not questions. This talk has helped me frame, you know, this kind of classical uh, exchange of like energy or calorie or, uh, I don't know. Uh, it's. I was just struck by that question, This, you know, why has human labor survived? Well, I would say basically, because so far it's turned out to be too difficult to produce what Carol Kapak talked about, which is a universal robot. The, his novel was Rossum's Universal, or his play was Rossum's Universal Robots. And Rossum's robots could do anything. They could do anything that a human worker could do. They could have got on a bicycle and delivered food. They could have uh, climbed the rigging of a ship and uh, pulled in the sails. They could do anything a human could do. The reason they could do it is because Rossum's robots had a human-like body. They not only had human ability of judgment, but they had human-like hands. Now, so far, we've been protected because up until now, getting a body with the mobility and dexterity of a human being has been difficult. And getting the ability 
to na navigate and do things in a cluttered environment has been difficult. But the, the rate at which the big tech firms are progressing this is so fast that I don't think it'll be that long before robots of that type can be produced. I don't know whether you, you, you've watched any videos of bots and robotics machines. They're scary. Sorry, it's Boston Dynamics. Uh, hey, Paul. Um, thanks for this. That was great. Um, I was curious uh, when you placed these sort of uh, comparisons uh, between Babbage and sort of some of the language used in uh, Adam Smith. Um, I wonder if, I'm sure you thought about this, but what is the role of church uh, in all this? Because uh, to me, uh, some of my research shows that there is also an ideological level in which church has a, a kind of instrumental role. Do you mean the Do you mean the logician church, or do you mean the church uh, uh, as no, an institution? Church like uh, institution, yeah, institution. Okay. Well, the reason I say this, I mean, sorry, Babbage believed that he could demonstrate miracles with the difference engine. Um, he thought miracles were discontinuous functions, but uh, he uh, he was he he was basically a Church of England reformist. He wanted to create uh, basically cooperative factories, worker-owned factories, to mitigate the worst evils that he could see from industrial automation, but he was a Christian. That's the only, it's the only point where I can see the church entering into Babbage's work. Um, the reason I'm asking is because um, I, I have re I've done some work on this, um, trying to see a bit this connection of, of the history of computation. And, and it took me to, to Basically, when you when you mentioned about the trigonometric functions as a table with numbers, um, it reminded me of the computus as a as a practice uh, that the church used um, as a way of organizing time, and and those tables are you know much earlier, like yes. uh, middle age, uh, medieval times. Um, so I was curious to see if if there's some some connection there as well of like this idea of like you know data gathering or like you know, uh, calculations, computations being carried out. Um, if that idea of the church having an active role in that, uh, if you found that there is a, let's uh, say, a narrative that... I, I would guess myself that the basic technique of constructing tables goes back at least to the Egyptians or Babylonians and was part of the inherited cultural history um, by the by the Middle Ages. The application of it to astronomical tables couldn't be done till calculus had been developed. So that's later. But the idea of being able to con construct tables of differences, that was certainly known to the Babylonians from as a way of approximating things. But, I, and I would assume that insofar as the church uh, captured some of the pre-existing culture of classical society, uh, these kinds of techniques would have been passed down to the church. Thanks. Thank you, Paul, for the, the session. It was really interesting, and um, like especially these things of automation and what you the book that you recommended for Kurt Vonnegut. 
uh, because like it's especially interesting for me because I'm also working uh, with a lot of um, like working with art and technology and there's like a lot of this hype with automation and AI and, and I feel like like those uh, like this fear of uh, like being replaced by uh, technology is still like something that's like looming over. I, I'm sorry that uh... If I was, if I had been giving this lecture um, a few years ago in my office at the university, I'd have the books on my shelf behind me. Uh, when I retired a few years ago, I gave them all away to the students. Um, but the, the the novel is "Play a Piano" by Kurt Vonnegut. Um, there's another book. Oh, I'd, I'd have to do a Google search to get the author. It's called Mechanization Takes Command and was published about the same time as Kurt Vonnegut's. And it's on the same thing. Hold on. Let me check check the, the reference. Okay. Ah, you can actually get that in PDF. Um, Minnesota University Press, 1948, same year as Player Piano. Okay, and that is a, a technical account of automation of the time. And it is quite astonishing the degree of automation that there actually was in American factories in the 1940s uh, and which were stimulating um, him. Uh, other than that, I mean, you, you, you've got to start following the robotics literature. The, the the actual contemporary robotics literature mm -hmm. um and, and the, the the difficulty in constructing general purpose robots is still on the one hand the dexterity the size mm -hmm. and the perceptual ability i mean i haven't worked on it now for about six years last thing i was working on was a cloth folding robot and that that was really required a lot of very difficult problems to be solved by a, a large team of 20 or 30 people and right. something which we can do without much <laughs> thinking think, yeah. required a huge investment but since then cloth folding robots have started to be actually sold so it's the the advance is very rapid I see. Yeah, thanks. Okay, uh, I will see you again on Wednesday.